It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Park. Thank you very, uh, very much, Speaker. Yes. Uh, obviously, I rise today, and uh, and uh, on behalf of all colleagues, uh, say our profound condolences to, to the political community with the passing of, of Mr. Hillier and yesterday of Mr. Ford. Uh, my question is for the Premier. On October 28th, the Premier said, and I quote, the agreements were in line with our net zero bargaining framework when she was referring to the secret union payouts with the teachers. On November 25th, the Premier said three more times that agreements were made with a net zero framework. Four stretch goals in a very small amount of time. Now today we find out from the CP's Allison Jones that the deals, quote, actually come with an additional $300 million cost. No. But that's just the tip of the iceberg because we know the Auditor General has yet to return Question. her report into her investigation of these secret payouts. So I ask the Premier, how does net zero equal $300 million? Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and I know that the Minister of Education is going to want to comment on this. And we're what we're talking about is uh, nine agreements, Mr. Speaker, that have been ratified, that are consistent with our uh, net zero bargaining framework, Mr. Speaker. Most importantly, students uh, remain in school. There were no cuts to the classroom, Mr. Speaker. There were modest wage increases that were offset by finding other savings throughout the collective agreement. But let just let me just say, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, the benefits, um, we're taking more than a thousand different benefit plans for teachers and education workers, moving them to a handful of provincial trusts. And I think that it would be interesting to the member opposite to know that for years, from the time I was a school trustee, from the time that the Minister of uh, Education was a school trustee, there has been a conversation in the education sector about how to rationalize the benefits package across the province, Mr. Speaker. That will save money, Order. Mr. Speaker, and that's why making Thank that you. move was so important. Important. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this is at least $300 million taken out of the education budget. That is not a rounding error. I know the Premier is not an accountant, but that's $300 million more dollars than she told this House. This is also, of course, the same Premier that told us the cancelled gas plants were only $40 billion before we found out the true cost was $1.2 billion. She is cutting demonstration, demonstration schools across this province. Special ed cuts everywhere. Parents are fundraising for basic necessities in our classroom. I ask the Premier, what does $300 million in education funding mean to her? Because it certainly doesn't mean pizzas and popcorn to me. Thank you. Again, Mr. Speaker, let me just... Let Sorry, I, I didn't recognize you, Premier. Carry on, please. Let me uh, let me just say, Mr. Speaker. Oh, shame. Let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that the uh, the changes Order. in the benefits, Mr. Speaker, are uh, changes that have been talked about in the sector for many years. Because when when the uh, school boards were amalgamated, Mr. Speaker, when the funding model changed in this province at the uh, at the hands of the previous government, Mr. Speaker, it only made sense to talk about how there could be savings in those benefits plans. Yeah. Finally, we've gotten to the point where we can do that, Mr. Speaker, yeah. where those benefit plans can be uh, can be amalgamated. There can be changes yeah. that will yeah. save yeah. money to the system. It will actually lower the cost yeah. of yeah. benefit plans through the power of bulk negotiation. It only makes sense, and Mr. Speaker. I actually would have thought this is the kind of efficiency and yeah. savings that that Answer. party would support. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier of Ontario just had the audacity to look at this assembly and say that she found $300 million in efficiencies wow. when it cost more than a net zero, it cost $300 million. You can't trust this government anymore when they tell us it's going to cost one thing. Stop the clock. Um, the chippiness is pretty high, and I can read it, so I'm going to start looking at individuals. Carry on, please. The power worker deals had a net zero deal until we found out that it was $87 million more dollars to buy Hydro One shares. The teachers union deal was supposed to be net zero until we found out it's at least $300 million more dollars. You have one job, and that is to find net zeros 
in this government in order to balance the deficit, which you have no uh, objective of doing. So I would like to want, uh, understand from the Premier of Ontario, you've assigned somebody in the Treasury Board to find net zero deals. Question. You've failed at every turn. What is the Deputy Premier's job anyway if she can't here, here. find deals here? Yes, thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm delighted to answer this question. There were a thousand different benefit plans. Some of those benefit plans might have had 15 or 20 people in them. They were extraordinarily expensive. We have been talking since this problem in education, since I was the president of the public school boards, but we had no legal authority to do anything about it, to bring everybody together. For the first time in this, in this round of bargaining, because we had the authority to negotiate centrally, we actually have the ability to bring a thousand inefficient benefit plans into five or six pools. But when you set things up like that, there's an upfront Thank you. investment. Thank you. Be seated. Um, it's not helpful to hear uh, people using uh, other than titles or writings. And I'm going to put my foot down on that. New question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education this morning. Over the last six weeks or so, Speaker, I've received all kinds of letters, emails, phone calls, and visits of support for Saganaska Demonstration School in Belleville and the other demonstration schools in Ontario. I've heard countless success stories from kids who didn't think they had a future before going to these schools, and now they're breaking down barriers at their potential, reaching their potential at post-secondary institutions across Ontario. I met Chris a few weeks ago, who was a grade eight student, reading at a grade one level. In just a few months in the program, he was now back at his proper grade level when it came to reading. He was looking forward to going back to his home school and being a successful student at his grade level. In spite of success stories like that, the minister won't commit to Saganaska serving students Question. next year. I understand the minister is going to be in Belleville this evening at Saganaska. Will she finally commit to the school's future, or will she give parents and staff the same non-answers she's been giving the House for weeks? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as I've said many times, there is a consultation ongoing, and we have not made any decisions. Apparently, the members opposite know what the decision is, which is really quite mystical because I don't know. I'm consulting because we want to find out. We want to find out, Speaker. Order how we can ensure that thousands of children in Ontario who are reading below grade level can benefit from the sorts of programs that go on in the demonstration schools. We're not arguing about whether the demonstration school programs are successful. What we're bemoaning from Elgin, is the Middlesex, fact London. that there are thousands of children in Ontario who can't read. How do we solve Answer. the fact that thousands can't read? Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. They've capped enrollment. They're not even accepting enrollment. They're not even accepting enrollment for next year. They're sending the teachers who are seconded to these schools back to their home schools. The minister has clearly mastered the five Ds of question period. Dutch, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. That's what she's doing on a continual basis here at Queen's Park. I've got another one for her. Demand. The parents of Ontario's most vulnerable students are demanding an answer. They're going to be standing in front of the minister this evening demanding an answer to the future for their kids, a future that can best be provided by keeping Saganaska schools open. That's a future that this government and this minister are putting in doubt. I've got another D for her. This whole process has been a disgrace. It's been a disaster. It's been despicable because the minister will not give an answer as to why enrollment has been cancelled. Will she stand up before these parents, students, and staff tonight and tell them that there will be demonstrations for their parents? Thank you. Please. Please. Just a uh, just a general reminder that when I stand, you sit. Minister. Yes, thank you. 
And uh, I agree that there are a lot of people who are demanding answers, but some of the people who are demanding answers are the parents of children who don't have an opportunity to move away from home and attend a residential school and uh, to get remedial reading programs. Uh, the, question, the question was asked by the member from Prince Edward Hastings, and I'm sure you're going to listen. Carry on, please. Those parents are also demanding an answer. We know that there are a lot of children who have very severe learning disabilities. It's important to understand, Speaker, that this isn't all children with learning disabilities. This is children with very severe learning disabilities of average intelligence or above who are many, many grade levels behind in terms of answer. their ability to read. We need to figure out how to deliver programs that work to all those children. Thank you. Good question, the leader of the third party. Uh, speaker? Third? Oh, sorry, final supplementary. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Hey, speaker, uh, back, back to the minister. Uh, speaker, recently I met with a courageous constituent from my riding of Chatham, Kent, Essex, named Katie. She was diagnosed with a severe learning disability, and her reading level had not progressed beyond grade three. After six months at the Amthus Demonstration School in London, she's reading slightly above a grade seven level. After six months, the school has given Katie confidence to believe in herself, but she's worried that the government is considering closing her school. Katie said, and I quote, if, it was not, if I was not given the opportunity to attend a demonstration school, I would have struggled through school and felt like a failure. Please don't devastate these families, Minister. So, Speaker, to the Minister, can the minister assure Katie and her parents that her demonstration school in London will be open in September? Thank you. I apologize to the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex uh, for losing track. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And I, I think what we need to do is talk to all the Katies in the province who are having challenges reading and tell all the Katies in the province. Right now, Speaker, uh, there's a maximum of 40 uh, children at each of the four demonstration school. In fact, well, the member opposite says that that's capped, but in fact, there are less than 40 children at each of the demonstration schools, not because you know, because that was how many qualified. So, the, for this very specific criteria. So, we have less than 160 children in the entire province who are getting the benefit of these very strong remedial reading programs. We need to make sure Answer. that we look after all the Katies in the province yeah, who right. need similar remedial programs. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. My Thank apologies. You, Speaker. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, seniors organizations from across Ontario have written to the Premier. I'm sure she's received the letter. Uh, they said, quote, we are asking you to cancel the fee increases for seniors and uphold the principle of universality for our health care system. Will the Premier listen to the nearly 60 organizations who have written to her and cancel her plan to increase the cost of prescription drugs, drugs for seniors. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the leader of the third party is very aware that uh, that there is a regulation that has been posted, that there is a consultation uh, going on right now, and that and that those organizations will be obviously very interested in uh, giving us feedback, and we will be listening very carefully to them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party also knows that uh, our policy that uh, that was uh, the member from Hamilton Stony Creek means that 173,000 more seniors will pay no deductible, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Seniors who paid deductible previously will pay no deductible. That was the intention of the uh, that was the intention of the plan. And Mr. Speaker, we said that on the second part of the plan, we were going to be listening to people as the regulation was posted. And if we didn't get that part right, then we would adjust it. I think the leader of the third party knows that. We said that repeatedly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, earlier this month, I asked the Premier whether she believed in universal health care, and that means. That means, Speaker, that uh, if you need care, you can get it, no matter who you are and no matter what your income is. And she said 
Yes, Speaker. But what she is doing and what she just spoke about a moment ago, Speaker, is moving in exactly the opposite direction of universality. Yeah. Ontario seniors put it pretty bluntly in the letter that they sent the Premier Speaker. They said she, they said she is abandoning this principle and dismantling universe, universality. So, will this Premier do the right thing and cancel her plan to nearly double the prescription costs for seniors. Thank you. Health and long-term care. Mr. Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is no stronger defender of universal health care in this province than our Premier, Mr. Speaker. And she will remain that way. And when it comes to seniors, When it comes to seniors, Mr. Speaker, evidence of that is that our seniors in this province have the lowest, by far, the lowest out-of-pocket expenses for drugs, Mr. In Speaker, and it, our, it averages $277 per annum for our seniors in this province. Let's go to Manitoba, where the average out-of-pocket cost is $982 per year, or Saskatchewan, $884 per year. Or in British Columbia, six hundred and fifteen dollars. Or in Alberta, where it's six hundred and thirteen dollars. More than twice the cost of this province. We have the lowest out-of-pocket costs to our seniors because we are so generous to our seniors when it comes to providing the drugs that they need, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. This health minister can stand in his place and spout rhetoric, but actions speak louder than words. Across Ontario are worried about the Premier's plan to nearly double their drug costs. Today, nearly 60 organizations wrote to the Premier to tell her to cancel this plan. Our Queen's, Queen's Park offices, our constituency offices have been getting letters and emails and phone calls from worried seniors. And I'll bet that every Liberal backbencher is getting the same calls and emails and letters as we are on this side of the House. And they know what, what that means for their jobs if they ignore those seniors. The Premier's acknowledge that she's made a mistake. Will she do the right thing for seniors and cancel her plan to increase their prescription drug costs? Well, Mr. Speaker, it's not surprising that the NDP doesn't support our efforts to move 173,000 more seniors so they pay no annual deductible. Because here's their record when they were in power. They removed coverage for over 230 drugs from the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, over 10 percent of all drugs on the formulary at that time. And the health minister at that time, all that, that, that the health minister would state is that these drugs would be available to low-income seniors for reasonable prices at pharmacies. They closed 24 per cent of acute hospital beds, Mr. Speaker. They closed 13 per cent of mental health beds across this province. And in their last budget in 1995, they reduced hospital funding by 1 per cent, which was the second year in a row of reducing total health care funding. Mr. Speaker, we don't need to take lessons from the NDP. Our government was a disaster when it came to health care. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, but I have to say what we don't support on this side of the House in the NDP benches is the abandonment of the universal health care system in this province. The Premier has received a letter, Speaker, that is signed by the Alliance of Seniors. Stop the clock. I'm, uh, well, there's, there's going to be the member, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs is now uh, on notice. Anyone else want to comment? Leader. The Premier has received a letter that's been signed by the Alliance of Seniors, local health coalitions, CARP chapters, Jewish, Chinese and Tamil seniors associations, unions and retiree associations. Speaker. Will this Premier tell these groups how many seniors will see their drug costs nearly double? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, I will say that I understand, I really do understand that it serves the leader of the third party's political purposes to, um, to set a fire where there isn't one, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, the reality is that our budget removes all costs for drugs from 173,000 students. There was a second part to that. Uh, that seniors. Seniors, seniors, sorry. I'm not talking about um, seniors. Removes, removes the cost of drugs from 173,000 yeah. more seniors, Zero. Mr. Speaker. And we said that in terms of the, uh, the deductible, that we would consult, we would look at that, Mr. Speaker, and if we had got the threshold wrong, we would change it. That's the process we're undergoing right now, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party knows that. She knows that Answer. seniors have an opportunity to give us feedback, and we've said we will change it, Mr. Speaker, if we got it wrong. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it's not just myself as the leader of the Ontario New Democrats that are concerned about this. It's 60 seniors organizations that are setting a fire, Speaker, and that's what the Premier needs to pay attention to. The Premier just isn't listening to Ontarians once again. First, it was the decision to sell Hydro One, even though everybody knows that's a bad idea, and now it's her plan for seniors' drugs. Unless the Premier cancels her plan, potentially millions of seniors in Ontario are going to see their drug costs shoot through the roof. Seniors groups, seniors groups are telling her to cancel this plan because it will undermine the fundamental principles of our health care system uh, that our health care system has been built on in this province and in this country. Can the Premier tell Question. Ontarians what happened to the basic idea that government should be listening to people and governing for all Ontarians? Thank you. Oh, Mr. Thank you. Speaker, and listening to people is exactly what we did, which is why 173,000 more seniors will not pay any deductible, Mr. Speaker. That is exactly what we did. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, as I have said, there is a regulation in place. There is comment on the, uh, the regulation that we are receiving right now. We have said, Mr. Speaker, if that second part of the initiative we didn't get right, we will change the, uh, we'll change the threshold. But, Mr. Speaker, we will not do that because the NDP is ranting at us, Mr. Speaker, in an irrational way when we've already said that we're going to consult on this, we're going to look at it, and if we got it wrong, we'll change it. So the leader of the third party, for her own political reasons, can ramp up the rhetoric. She can pretend that somehow this is a cause that she has championed. Mr. Speaker, 173,000 seniors in this province will pay no more deductible. We will make a change if that's necessary. We will listen to the people yes, of the province. We will listen to the seniors who are affected. We will not Thank follow you. the lead of the NDP. Thank you. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, I know that this Premier doesn't like the fact that we have a de democratic process here and the opposition has a role, but that's actually the truth, and she's going to have to get used to it. The Premier admitted that this plan was a, a mistake. She's being revisionist now by saying that she actually listened to people. Mr. Speaker, stop the clock. Stop the clock. Question. She's being revisionist now and saying that she actually listened to people when everybody knows she threw this into her budget without listening to anybody because they had it written uh, before they even started their budget consultations, and nobody knew that they were going to be increasing drug costs for seniors. So she admitted that the plan was a mistake. She's given herself until next Wednesday to start making changes, and she said if people spoke up, she'd make a change. Well, people are speaking up, Speaker. Today's groups representing hundreds of thousands of seniors are telling Telling the Premier that the Liberal plan is wrong. So will she listen to Ontario seniors, cancel her plan to nearly double drug costs, and uphold the core value Question. that health care should be universal here in Ontario? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I can understand why the NDP won't talk about and doesn't appear to support 170,000 more seniors who will go from paying $100 a year deductible to zero. And they will actually be added to about 300,000 people that are currently in that position. Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, second time. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, when those 173,000 are added to the existing lowest income seniors, almost half a million seniors out of the two million that are in this province Answer. pay no annual deductible. That's nearly 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. But I understand why they don't support this. They didn't support us on PSW wage increase. And that Thank you. New question? The member from Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Goodwill Toronto's bankruptcy. Goodwill Toronto's bankruptcy filing shows that its 430 employees are owed $4.2 million in severance and vacation pay. Mr. Speaker, they are unlikely to see a dime from the settlement. Meanwhile, the outgoing CEO received all of her $240,000 salary right up to the time she abandoned ship. By that time, the 11 board members were already gone. The Employment Standards Act is clear. The directors are personally liable for employees' vacation pay. They cannot run from this. Will the minister guarantee that Goodwill's employees will get the money they are owed from the runaway board of directors? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for that question. Certainly, it is, uh, it is um, an incident that concerns us all here in the province of Ontario when we see an incident like that happen. At the Ministry of Labour, we have an Employment Standards Act that's administered by the group. We go in in situations like this, and we ensure that people who have worked hard for that money are paid. What we have is an excellent track record of collecting funds. Obviously, from time to time, there are those people we can't collect from. I can tell you that work is ongoing with this file. We expect it to come to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Supplementary. Now back to the Minister of Labour, Speaker. Goodwill's board allowed the charity to run into the ground. Their decision to resign and abandon Toronto's most vulnerable is nothing short of cowardly. Chief amongst the Dodgers is David Wyatt. Director of Design and Policy at the ORPP Implementation Secretariat. Perhaps the minister responsible for the ORPP met Mr. Y through the outgoing Goodwill CEO, her former colleague at Toronto Community Housing. Oh. Mr. Speaker, will the minister throw the book at Goodwill's board members for unpaid wages, or will there be a special deal for friends of Liberal cabinet ministers? Speaker, that, that question's beneath. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to suggest to the member that he's desperately close to uh, making an accusation that is not parliamentary, but I'm going to let it go with the warning that those kinds of accusations are not acceptable in the House in terms of members of this place. Thank you, Speaker. I think most people in this House agree with you entirely in that ruling. Thank you. The federal government's got exclusive jurisdiction over bankruptcies and insolvencies, and you know that. We have made our government's position known on this. The member from Lanark knows better, and he's got to stop doing that. And I'm, I'm not going to tolerate that anymore because I've been hearing some nicknames coming from him, and it's not acceptable in this place. Yes. Carry on. Speaker, the uh, ministry provided funding to Goodwill, and that funding was provided on a monthly basis. As soon as the ministry became aware of the program closure, Speaker, all payments were stopped. Answer. We've connected with a number of these individuals uh, with new employment support, Speaker. I think the ministry and this government has Thank done you. everything it could. Thank you. Two questions. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier this morning. Premier, the member from Sault Ste. Marie continues to publicly raise a thousand reasons why the province can't do anything but watch the steel industry in his community and its good-paying jobs dry up and blow away. 
But the mayor and council have asked this premier and this government to act now to avoid SR Algoma Steel's operations from going down the exact same road as has happened in Hamilton and the U.S. Steel Stelco's operation. Order. The Premier met with Chinese officials. She's met with the owners of SR Steel overseas. Will the Premier meet with the mayor of a city in her province who is looking for help for thousands of members in his community? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I, I appreciate the question. And I, I just want to say that um, there is nobody who is uh, working harder to make sure that the steel oh, yeah. industry in Ontario is healthy than the member of the Chamber. Nobody. People of Sault Ste. Marie know that. I know that the steel industry in Ontario knows that. Uh, the member for Sault Ste. Marie is a fierce advocate for the steel industry, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and you know uh, he will he will continue to look for solutions. And, Mr. Speaker, we have as a, a government we have a responsibility to look at the uh, look at the steel industry in in Ontario in the context of the steel industry nationally and internationally, Answer. Mr. Speaker. That's exactly the point that the member for Sault Ste. Marie has made. And, Mr. Speaker, I will meet with anyone who is interested who has some solutions to how we might resolve this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier, nobody is listening to the question. Speaker, with 8,000 jobs tied to the mills and another 8,000 pensioners, the failure of the steel mills for the people of Sault Ste. Marie is not an option. The mayor has asked the province to play a leading role in the restructuring process of SR Steel. Speaker, here's the question again. Does the Premier agree with her minister's comments? Is she prepared to meet with local municipal leaders, the unions, pensioners, creditors, and potential buyers to tell them that this province values steel manufacturing and sees a future for it in this province? Question. Thank you. Speaker, again, let me say that uh, this issue is uh, an issue that is a national issue and it's an international issue. I think it's page 128 of the federal budget. Page 128 of the federal budget actually commits to take actions that we have been calling on the federal government to take, Mr. Speaker. A recognition that the steel industry is critical to this country. It's critical to the supply chain of so many of the industries in Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that working in partnership with the federal government, there may be a solution to this. But, Mr. Speaker, one thing that is not going to work is talking down the steel industry in Ontario. Make sure, Mr. Speaker, make no mistake, we are going to do everything in our power to retain the steel industry in Ontario and support it in conjunction with the federal government. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Minister Murray. Yesterday, March the 22nd, marked the annual International World Water Day. Since 1993, it is held annually as a means of focusing attention on the importance of fresh water and advocating for the sustainable management of freshwater resources. It's been estimated Remember that 615 from Hamilton, uh, East, million uh, Hamilton people, Mountain. or 10 percent of the world's population, do not have access to safe water, putting them at risk of infectious diseases and premature death. We are extremely fortunate in Ontario and Canada to have access to clean water. That's why on World Water Day, we all have a, world, a role to play in protecting and restoring our waterways. Can the minister please inform the House about some of the work the ministry is doing to preserve clean water in our province? Thank you, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes, yesterday was international was World Water Day. I also want to start by thanking the member for the leadership that she has been uh, been undertaking. As you know, the Lake Simcoe Water Protection Plan is the model on which the Great Lakes Protection Act was was uh, was advanced. And I want to thank my friends at uh, ministers of. Uh, OMAFRA and uh, to MNRNF are two key partner ministries in implementing the Great Lakes Protection Act. Uh, this act 
and the Guardian Council, which had its first meeting today, had nine chiefs and grand chiefs. It had AMO. It had uh, my friend Don McKay from the Ontario uh, Federation of Agriculture. It was 35 people who spent yesterday afternoon looking at priorities and solutions to improve the quality of the Great Lakes, Mr. Speaker. We are very quickly moving on this legislature's leadership and passing the Great Lakes Protection Act. And the first meeting yesterday, I think, was described by everybody as a great success. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you to the minister for that answer. I've seen the efforts of the government in protecting our water resources close to my home, as he has, uh, has stated. In my riding of Barrie, our government launched the Lake Sim Simcoe Protection Plan in 2009. It remains the most comprehensive watershed-based legislated plan to reduce phosphorus pollution and improve water quality and fish habitat in Lake Simcoe. In October, we released the five-year report back that shows that the health of Lake Simcoe is improving. Also, last fall, our government passed the Great Lakes Protection Act legislation. The Great Lakes account for 21 per cent of the world's surface fresh water by volume. We must take care of them. Can the minister please provide an update on our government's efforts to, to, in protecting the Great Lakes, one of our greatest natural resources? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've been, we're, we run something called the, Guardian, uh, the Great Lakes uh, Guardian Fund, which puts out almost 100 community projects we fund across the Great Lakes and First Nations communities and municipalities. But there are partnerships that are um, already developing, Mr. Speaker. One, one of the presentations yesterday was from our friend Don McCabe, the President of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, and the Warden of Bruce County, the Mayor of Bruce Kinross, who are doing, and the member from uh, here on Bruce will know this, they are, are doing a partnership right now around tiling that's going to significantly reduce the amount of nutrients going into the lake. These, we now have a whole system of coordinated actions, and we're improving data collection in the lakes. We'll have a be, working with natural resources and forestry. We'll have both better data on the quality of fish, invasive and species, as well as pesticides, uh, pharmaceuticals, and other problems in road salt in the lake. Speaker, it's a great day and very, very great way to celebrate World Water Day. Question: The member from Holland and Norfolk. To the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, in his most recent uh, budget, the Minister for Rural Affairs quietly suspended the Rural Economic Development Fund. It's a $14 million program specifically for rural areas. So what does this mean, Speaker? Uh, Kempville's business retention and expansion program is in limbo, no access to the grant. Meaford's uh, Barn Business Cooperative is waiting Shame. for an answer. What about the Ontario Water Centre project in uh, Clearwater? Speaker, when will this minister do his job? Halt the suspension and actually fight for people in rural Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Please. 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 Thank you. Minister Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question for the member from Hall of Norfolk this morning. It indeed, uh, I remember that party uh, when the previous Premier of Ontario announced the Drummond Commission, and the Drummond Commission looked at all the business support programs in the province of Ontario, and I remember they would stand up day in and day out and implement all the recommendations for the Drummond Commission, and one of those uh, recommendations was to move all our business support programs under one umbrella. That's exactly what we're doing with the RED program. We're moving it over to my colleague, Minister Duguid, under the Jobs and Prosperity Fund. Uh, people that were formerly supported by RED will now be able to make applications to the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, and we'll continue, Mr. Speaker, to invest in rural Ontario. Supplementary. Well, again, to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the Minister once said, and I quote, with the help of the RED program, rural communities will be better positioned to attract investment, create jobs, and sustain a highly skilled right. uh, workforce. So despite the minister's obvious uh, belief in the program, he suspended it. However, Speaker, when meeting with Oxford County farmers February 22nd, the minister told them that the uh, applications, and I quote, were, were in the pipeline, they would be reviewed shortly. My question. 
Did the Minister of Rural Affairs not know that his government suspended his vital rural program, or does he simply not care when he tells people across rural Ontario? Thank you. Minister? Minister, thank you, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the, uh, the member uh, from uh, Hullabador for asking me a supplementary. We indeed certainly believe that the RED program is very important to rural Ontario. That's why we uh, took the components of the RED program and, as the Drummond Commission recommended, put it under one program, under Jobs and Prosperity Fund. We'll continue to look at those applications that are in the pipeline to make sure that they are honoured because they have significant importance to rural communities. But I remind you, Mr. Speaker, when they're in power, they closed 32 ag offices right across the province of Ontario. Any question? The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. A few weeks ago, the legislature hosted students for the model parliament. Seamus McKenna Order. from Hamilton Mountain was one of them. Seamus has struggled throughout his school years due to a severe learning disability. But last September, things changed dramatically for him when he started attending the Trillium Demonstration School. And a couple of months ago, he took it upon himself to apply for the model parliament program. It was an incredible achievement that neither he nor his family thought was possible. It's a striking testament to the value of our demonstration schools and the positive effects that it has for our most vulnerable kids. Will the minister tell Seamus and other families across this province that, they, that their specialized schools will stay open? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And once again, I'm pleased to, uh, may, uh, to respond to this question. Um, once again, no decisions have been made. We are reviewing the program. But what is very clear is the program has been a success. We understand that. This is one more example of a student who has fallen way, way behind multiple grades in terms of their reading. They have taken a very focused program at one of the demonstration schools. They have caught up in their reading, and they have been able to go back into the regular school. We want that for more than just about 150 enrollment right now in the four demonstration schools. We want that for more students. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. I think the minister just said that closing down programs will make it e equally inaccessible. It doesn't make sense, minister. Last week, Seamus told me that tackling the required 400-word essay to apply for the model parliament would never have been possible without access to the demonstration school programming. Attending Trillium gave Seamus the confidence to apply, even without telling the adults in his life. Seamus is only one of the many students that I have heard from on this important access to specialized environment in the school, especially when this government continues to cut special education funding from school boards. $22 million was taken away from various boards last year. Families and kids deserve better from this government. I will ask again, will the minister Question. commit today to keeping these schools open? Thank you. Minister. So, first of all, the NDP does have a problem with the definition of cuts. $22.5 billion two years in a row is not a cut, especially when there were less students this year than the previous year. That actually means we spent more per pupil. But what I do want to do is congratulate yeah. Seamus yeah. and on his wonderful, uh, his wonderful achievement in being accepted to the model school. Students in the demonstration schools described to me the wonderful experience of being able to read a novel for the first time in their life, of being able to read a textbook for the first time in their life, of being able to write a le an essay for the first time in their life. Yeah. We want more students to have that experience, Answer. and that's why we're focusing on the consultation process to find out how to improve the experience for more students. Thank you. New question, the member from Halton. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we know that openness and transparency are key to good government. In fact, the more we know about how we are doing, the better job we can do to create a strong, competitive environment for people and businesses in Ontario to thrive. In my riding of Halton, there are dozens of new and emerging businesses opening their doors all the time. For them to be successful, they must have strong, useful information so they can plan for the future. Minister, yesterday, the quarterly Ontario Energy Report was posted. It provides a wealth of information and data about electricity, oil and natural gas in the province. This is valuable information for Ontario businesses. The document included the reporting of industrial electricity prices for all Canadian provinces and U.S. states. This is the first time that the Ontario Energy Question. Report has provided jurisdictional comparison data. Minister, can you please tell us more about this ad additional information on electricity prices? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Question. Speaker, I thank the member from Halton for the question. Uh, the Ontario government is committed to being the most open, transparent and accountable government in the country, Speaker, and opening up government data supports this commitment. Yeah. We're proud to say that the ISO has made North American jurisdictional data for industrial electricity prices available through yesterday's release of the Ontario Energy Report. In their 2016 Emerging Stronger Report, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce proposed enhancing the transparency of electricity pricing. We thank them for their helpful work. Speaker, this report provides more information on industrial electricity prices in Ontario and a transparent comparison that demonstrates how competitive Ontario's industrial rates are within North America, and we're proud to have made that possible. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for that answer and for his hard work in the energy sector. This information will be extremely helpful to the business community and other stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, I have spoken with numerous Halton residents and business owners about the cost of electricity, and they often ask for more information. People want to understand how and why rates change. Measuring and putting our electricity rate into context through these comparisons is key to better understanding the electricity system and how it works. By improving access to vital data, we help businesses grow, spur innovation, and solve problems. By increasing transparency, accountability and, and ed engagement, the result is better policy, better programs and better outcomes for all Ontarians. Minister, can you please share with the House Mr. what the results of this comparison indicate? Thank you, Minister. The speaker, the results of this comparison indicate that our hard work to maintain competitive electricity rates is showing results. Industrial rates in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 49 American states. And industrial rates in Southern Ontario are lower than in Michigan, Wisconsin, New Jersey, California, and below the American average, Speaker. And while other jurisdictions are still burning dirty coal for two-thirds of their party, Order. Our, our government is proud that we have achieved competitive rates while undertaking the largest climate change initiative in North America, Speaker. The, the members are publicly Scramble. available to the Ontario Energy Report website. The member from members opposite, Speaker, should recognize these facts and stop discouraging industry investments in Ontario. The opposition may choose to talk Ontario down, Speaker, but we will continue Answer. to work with our partners in industry to build this province up. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Gray, South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. We understand your government is prepared to repeat history with Orange as Orange Air signs yet another lease with Augusta Westland, the same company under criminal investigation by the OPP Anti-Rackets Branch. For the past 13 years, your government has wasted billions of dollars on shady contracts. From SAMS and eHealth to Orange, money is being squandered instead of being invested where it is needed the most, making our seniors drug care affordable and increasing access to long-term care beds. I'd like to know from the minister, how does she feel about this continued waste and mismanagement at a time when her government is looking to double the cost of seniors' drugs, when 24,000 seniors are without access to a nursing bed, and when she's yet to find money to rebuild 30,000 outdated beds? Yeah. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask, what is her plan to address these glaring and negative impacts to our That's seniors? That's a good, good question. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Mr. Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are so many elements to that question. I hope you'll forgive me if I focus on one or two. I hope they're the ones that you intended. We could perhaps in supplementary. But uh, again, as I said earlier this week, when it comes to Orange, we're in a new regime, a new culture at Orange as well, where patient satisfaction is as good as it has ever been. It's actually excellent in terms of the patient experience. Those 18,000 individuals that depend on air transport, either fixed wing or helicopter transport uh, across this province, we have a brand new board. We have a new governance structure, a new level of accountability and transparency that is so effective at providing that important care that people need at a time of, of crisis. Answer. But, Mr. Speaker, I, I would uh, hope that in the supplementary question there's some some, uh, guidance to me and specifically which issue the uh, member opposite yeah. would like me to focus Thank on. You. <laughs> Supplementary. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll make it simple. Maybe you should start respecting seniors. Here, here. Last week, I held a media conference here at Queen's Park to repeat my call to issue a plan of action on when and where you will build the needed beds that you, uh, your government has promised and to halt your government's plan to double the cost of seniors' drugs. If you denounce the waste and billions spent on failed programs like eHealth, Orange and Sam's and started managing your budgets properly and didn't spend $12 billion a year in interest payments, then you'd have the money for the seniors' drug plan and money to build the needed nursing home beds and eliminate the shameful long-term care wait list. Mr. Speaker, how can this minister defend the Orange contract and the amount spent on interest to support the government's overspending in the face of 24,000 seniors without access to a nursing bed and seniors facing nearly double prescription drug costs. Here, here. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, apart from the $12 billion over the next decade that we're spending on capital investments for new hospitals, apart from the $345 million new dollars that we're investing in our hospitals, over a billion new dollars in our health care, here's what we're doing for our seniors, an additional $250 million each year growing for home and community care, $75 million over three years for community-based hospice and palliative care, Mr. Speaker. We're expanding as the uh, member referenced, 173,000 more seniors going from $100 deductible for their drugs to $0 deductible. The shingles vaccine, making that available, a savings uh, estimated $170 per senior between 65 and 70 years of age. We're removing the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker. We're adding $10 million into our long-term care homes for behavioral supports because Answer. we're seeing more dementia, including Alzheimer's. There are many, many things that we're doing for our seniors so that we're providing them with the service that they support. That Thank they you. require and deserve. Right. New question. The member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier knows that the Ontario Heritage Act and other laws protect archaeological and burial sites in our province. Yet, while the Premier was Minister of Transportation, she allowed the construction of the new Allendale Gold Station in Barrie. She allowed the digging through the ossuary. She allowed an area containing hundreds of bodies and one of the oldest here in Wendak village found to date. Speaker, we have strict laws in Ontario to protect these sites. They carry severe penalty, millions of dollars, and jail term. What is the Premier going to do to hold to account the people who have done wrong and allow the desecration of this historical First Nation site? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Terms of Culture and Sport. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to first start by saying that uh, our government has uh, a lot of respect for the heritage and uh, and the uh, a respect for the Aboriginal community here in the province of Ontario, and will continue to work to make sure that uh, we continue to build a strong relationship. And I also know that the Minister of Government and uh, Consumer Services has wanted uh, weigh in on this issue. Uh, I want to just uh, say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we're a government uh, that uh, that first government in 30 years to change the Heritage Act here in the province of Ontario. We made those changes to make sure that uh, we brought in the consultation with the Aboriginal community. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at any given moment, when we find uh, human remains or any uh, heritage significance uh, pieces through the archaeological uh, process, it automatically goes to the third phase. And we're currently in that phase right now. And um, and uh, it's a little bit too early to say what the next Answer. step is, um, but. We will make sure that uh, this uh, file is handled in a very respectful way. And I'd like to thank the member for the question. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, there has been seven, and count them, seven archaeological reports done on this rare Euron Wendak burial site. 
that is now the Allen Go station. All of them said not to go ahead and look for burial first. But no, instead of taking these reports into account, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport looked at the one report that said, go ahead and dig. They ignored all of the other. They ignored their own work. They ignored their own letter that they wrote to the city of Barrie saying that this site needed further archaeological work because of the artifacts on site. Speaker, the government broke their own law. There should be consequences to that. Why was this government so negligent in their action? And when will they hold the people to account? And more importantly, when will they fix this wrong? To which Speaker. Minister. Uh, to the Minister of uh, Government and Consumer Services. Minister of thank Government you, and Consumer Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and uh, pleased to uh, take the supplementary uh, question. Uh, the determination as to whether or not the area is an Aboriginal people's burial ground is made by the Register of Cemeteries, and uh, we obviously take this issue uh, very seriously. This decision is informed by archaeological reports that are currently being reviewed. Uh, they're being reviewed by MTCS uh, and my colleague, uh, Minister Coteau's uh, ministry. And we will not be accepting the final archaeological report until we are convinced that all of the content uh, it meets the highest archaeological standards and they've all been complied with in Ontario. The former register, Michael DeMello, was in contact with Chief Sharon Stinson uh, Henry of the Chippewa Rama First Nation and with legal counsel as well. And the current register, Nancy Watkins, is reviewing the file and uh, speaking to them as well. My staff have been Answer. in contact with the registrar speaker, and we are ensuring that all processes that are required to be followed under the uh, legislation Thank will you. be followed. Thank you. New question. From, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, we know that children do better in school when they have a full stomach. Research and my own experience as a teacher demonstrates that hunger affects kids' ability to learn. But we also know that some children are not able to eat a full breakfast at home before school starts. Other families are not able to send a full lunch and snacks to schools with their kids. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share with us how her ministry is supporting school children in Mississauga, Brampton South and across Ontario with access to nutritious meals and snacks? Thank you. Minister Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga, Brampton South, for this very important question. I'm very proud to say, Speaker, that the Ontario Student Nutrition Programs help support uh, breakfast snacks and lunch programs in schools in a wide range of communities and locations across our province. This program plays a very important role in supporting healthy development of children and youth and readying them to learn. Over the past two years, Speaker, the province has invested an additional $13.3 million to expand and enhance this very important program. The investments are part of our Ontario Healthy Kids Strategy Program, and it's part of our Ontario Poverty Reduction Strategy, Speaker. When fully implemented at the end of the school year, the funding is expected to provide approximately 89,000 more children and youth with Answer. access to nutritious breakfast programs in 540 higher-need schools, and there will be more students uh, to be Thank served you. coming forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the minister for her answer. This program is certainly impressive, and I'm glad to hear that it helped over three-quarters of a million children and youth last year. Mr. Speaker, this program, as I mentioned, clearly helps kids focus on their learning in the classroom. It also sounds like the student nutrition program plays an important role in poverty reduction in our province. And we know that some First Nations communities experience higher than average levels of poverty. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share with us the steps our ministry is taking to provide nutritious food to First Nations youth in our schools. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Minister. Thank you. Uh, and again, I want to thank the member for the question. And she's absolutely right. We know that many First Nations communities have difficulty 
uh, accessing affordable, nutritious food, Speaker. And that's why we are investing more than $4 million by 2000, uh, 2017 to support student nutrition programs in First Nations educational settings. By expanding the uh, student nutrition a program speaker, more First Nations children and youth will have access to nutritious food that supports their learning and healthy development. Over 60 First Nations communities have worked with their leadership to develop new program models that will suit the needs of their communities and incorporate cultural practices into their program, which I think we'll all, we all agree is very important. New First Nations student nutrition programs will be phased in over the next uh, two Answer. years, school, uh, two years uh, school year, Speaker, and we're very, very pleased to support this program. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Environment Minister. Speaker, the Liberal government has banned the use of a pesticide that farmers rely on across Ontario while making the claim that this measure will save bees. But a scientific study released by Health Canada and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency earlier this year found that using this pesticide for seed treatment actually poses no potential risk to bees. Those are the facts. That is the evidence. Yet the Liberals keep on with their neonic ban at a cost of $630 million to Ontario farmers. Speaker. So I have to ask the minister, has he even reviewed the scientific evidence released by Health Canada, or is he cho choosing just to ignore it? Thank you, minister, Thank you uh, very much. Mr. Let, let's just correct a few facts here. One, there is no ban. There are bans in the world. We chose not. We chose not to ban it, Mr. Speaker, because we're taking a precautionary approach, and we realize that there are farmers who need this. I think all of us in this House would, would agree that a systemic neurotoxin that, uh, that is quite toxic, putting it in places in Ontario where there are none of the pests of which it controls don't make, doesn't make much sense. Uh, there are several PMRA studies, and at the same time, there is a, U a U.S. Uh, EPA study that showed over 50 percent of the non-managed bee losses are related to that. Mr. Speaker, this is one of four stressors. Uh, varroa mites, viruses and diseases, uh, climate change and weather impacts, and food deserts. Bees right now are under more stresses than they ever have been, and Quebec, yes, Mr. Speaker, went through the same process we went through and introduced the exact, exact same approach we have, and that is increasingly Thank the you. Ontario approach is being recognized as a reason. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I'm going to paraphrase. No, he did not read the Health Canada study. Uh, Again, back to the minister. Sure. Speaker, this minister yeah. claims to care about evidence. In fact, Speaker, he has even told his Twitter followers, and I quote, I have argued for evidence-based decision-making throughout my professional life. But when presented with scientific evidence released by Health Canada that challenges the foundation of this minister's neonic ban, he has chosen to ignore the facts. The minister's refusal to review the evidence contradicts its own statements and is, frankly, anti-science. Speaker, will the minister, who is not a scientist, please explain why he thinks he knows better than a team of scientific experts at Health Canada Question. and the U.S. Environment Protection Thank Agency? You. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. One of the things that we feel very strongly about on this side of the House is that you don't cherry-pick science. There are probably, there are over, a, Mr. Speaker, there are over a thousand. It's uh, never too late to ask for attention, nor ask people not to come back. There are well over a thousand major studies that have been done by Sussex, Purdue, Minnesota University, by the US EPA, and studies by, by PMRA. If, if the member has reviewed the, the Auditor General and the environment, Federal Environmental Commissioner's review of, of, of the PMRI studies, she would probably realize that I am the only one not who's raised some questions about it. But Mr. Speaker, the vast majority of science suggests there is a problem here. And in fact, Ontario and Quebec yes, and the Netherlands and the United States and some of the Western provinces, Mr. They, they don't seem to want to hear the facts. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No, that's, uh, your time is up. And as a reminder, uh, I do have a few people that have uh, points of order before we dismiss, and I'm going to deal with them right away.
The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We'd just like to remind members and their staff of uh, the reception this afternoon from 1 to 3 in the Legislative Library to honour Gloria Richards and her 42 years of public service to the province of Ontario. Here, here. Here. I'd like to thank the member for stepping on my announcement. So, <laughs> the member from Scarborough Agent Court on a point of order. I have two guests visiting us at Queens, to Queen's Park. My good friend Eden Gajaraj and his son Adam Gajaraj for visiting Queen's Park. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to um, ask your indulgence to welcome Dr. Millie Roy, the mother of our page Sohan van de Mosler, who's uh, uh, with us this week and then following week, and joining is his sister, Maya de Mosler, in the public gallery. Thank you. Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to uh, correct my record in response to the question supplementary for the member of Holloman Norfolk. In fact, it was 42 agriculture offices that were closed, not 32. Thank you. Yeah. The member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome. Question period is over. I'm trying to entertain people's points of order. Thank you. The member. Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome Paige Terry Kwong's mother, Julanda Zhang, and father, Gary Kang, to Queen's Park. Welcome to Queen's Park. I am going to double announce it uh, but with an announcement that there was an email sent to all members. Uh, you need to check. Uh, I was told no, but I checked and said they were sent, so it's a matter of making sure the communication breakdown is not there. However, more importantly, I'd like to remind the members that the retirement party for Gloria Richards is today at 1 p.m., third floor of the library. Uh, she would love to see you all. She's got all kinds of stories, and I will tell you that we're working on her book. Oh, we're going to have some good storytelling. There are no deferred votes this house. Whoops, sorry. Speaker Etta Coffer, just arrived. Oh, <laughs> former Speaker Etta Coffer is here in the Speaker's Gallery. Welcome to the former Speaker. We're glad you're with us. He got the email. I don't know about you guys. The uh, member from Beaches East York on a point of order. Yep. Sorry, Speaker. I meant to stand earlier, but uh, this afternoon at 12, we're raising the Bangladesh flag in the uh, in front lawn, and I welcome all members to attend. It's the largest speaking uh, second language in my community. Thank you. Okay, I think we got everything. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.